Uh, but as far as the Asiatic and Pacific theaters goes, uh, Pearl Harbor was the day, December 7, 1941. We woke up that morning to find our lovely, lovely station on fire, uh, ships sinking, all kinds of death. And we moved to, to the next event. We moved to the next event, which was Jimmy Doolittle. Probably a lot of you people have heard about Jimmy Doolittle. But he was so uh, courageous and had such ingenuity. He came up with the bright idea of assembling a B-25. And I noticed on, as I entered the area, there is a picture, there are several photos of B-25s. But he uh, got a, a group of 80 guys that volunteered to go fly these B-25s off of one of the Navy's aircraft carrier. Now he's a He's an army guy, so you can imagine the kind of uh, harmony we had there. But really, we did, except when we announced that you're going to be launched from an aircraft carrier, you said, God, I, I, I'll never get on, I'll never be able to land a 25 on an aircraft carrier. We said, you don't have to land it. We're going to put them on uh, with a derrick. But what you do have to is take off. Uh, and so, that's what they did. They, they put together 16 B-25s and uh, about the middle of the winter of 42, they took off and I'm not going into many details. It's a courageous story and most exciting. They flew over eventually Tokyo and Tokyo was totally disarmed. They, they thought we were on our back. The last they'd seen of us was really Pearl Harbor. And here we go flying over there brazenly with 16 B-25s. Low level, dropped bombs, and went on our way. Now as near as I can tell from history, they only lost two of those 16 at that point. Actually, they intended to go over Japan then go on to China, and they had no place to land. Uh, so they were going to bail out and, uh, and see how the luck worked out on this deal. And several of them, there was, uh, as far as I know, from this operation, they only lost something like 10 people. So, so out of the 80, they had r roughly 70. Uh, some of them ended up in Russia, some of them ended up in China, and, and some, some of them didn't get back till uh, a year later. But uh, that was a, a very upsetting thing from Japan's viewpoint. They thought that they'd never hear from us once they did Pearl Harbor. When, from there, we fought the islands, and those were horrible. Our troops, our airmen, and our, everybody had to live in tents uh, under subpar conditions, no, no uh, tents and no service to speak of. Our airfields were little patches of jungle they carved out of there. So it was very, very tough duty for those people. And that went on for quite some time. And you probably remember Corregidor in your uh, history study. And that's when uh, uh, MacArthur and Wainwright were, were trying to march out of there. And uh, MacArthur es escaped and got on a sub and came back to Australia. And Wainwright took the rest of the people, and that was one path of hell all the way through. The next thing, a big thing, uh, after the islands had been kind of secured, we'd made progress up those islands, uh, we got wind, Nimitz, who was the overall commander of this operation, got wind that um, we were going to have an attack, another surprise attack. They didn't know if it was going to be Hawaii, uh, Pearl Harbor uh, uh, again, or if it was going to be Midway, or uh, they even had Alaska in on it. In the meantime, the Japanese were sending balloons, free, free air balloons over, just to heckle us. They did absolutely no damage. They scared the you know what out of us. But uh, from there, the, the word went out to um, uh, Nimitz that uh, they got a word uh, through uh, our excellent breaking of their, of their code. We got word they had a big attack in mind, and uh, Nimitz turned the pro problem over to two of his lower echelon officers 
who were well groomed on the whole military scene and very bright guys. And Washington said, whatever you guys decide is it, we'll, we'll accept. Well, they came back and said it's going to be Midway. They said, oh, no, they would, they would mess with Midway as a little island in the Pacific. But they said it's going to be Midway, and it was. And that was the turning point of the war. It was bloody, it was tough. I think we lost at least three carriers and maybe four there. Uh, but guys like me were just kids then. Uh, I happened to be in, in the University of Minnesota as an aero engineer in my first year. Uh, the Navy realized after Midway, we lost almost every one of our original naval aviators. We had, we had a terrible loss. And we were down to like 86 ships, many of them not combat ready. Uh, we were in bad shape, but the Navy went out and put their feelers out and guys like me, uh, saw the information and, and were offered a course to learn how to fly free of charge. Uh, and many of us took, up, took Uncle up on that, and that's the way we got into the aviation business. But uh, I was only in the service. And some of the old veterans will say, well, wow, that kid, why is he? Uh, I was only in there two years and 10 months because they needed a guy like me uh, uh, real fast. And 10 months after I was in there, mind you, 10 months previous to b this point, I had virtually never been in an airplane. And 10 months later, I was a dive bomber pilot. Actually, I, I got my gold wings in. And during that graduation, I have to bring this in because a lot of, even though we knew that we had won the war, but the Japanese didn't know that, and uh, this graduation class was comprised of about 2,000 cadets. And we had the whites and, and all the hymns of the Republic and all the goodies uh, for our graduation. And then we were given our golden wings. From there, we went through training. And uh, a year later, we, in my case and most of those other people, uh, we were assigned to squadrons. Uh, I had, as a child, I had a mastoid problem, so when they gave me my physical, they found a scar on my eardrum, and they put in my application, no pressure changes if possible for this guy. So I got a dive bomber job. <laughs> you see, things don't always work out the way you plan. Well, anyway, uh, from, from this point in this talk, due to the fact that I've got a different crowd than, uh, than we had other times, I've, I've rearranged the talk a little bit, and I'm, I'm uh, homing in on the Yamato. On March 19th, 1945, we were going to hit Curry. Uh, Curry was a, by this time, we were well on the wind side of the ledger. As I mentioned, Japanese didn't know it and we hadn't d dropped the atomic bomb yet. But uh, w we were gonna go to Curry, which was one of their main bases on the Inland Sea, a promontory that overlooked the Inland Sea, which was the ocean d virtually running through their country. And uh, it gave them a beautiful deep water port. They, but this was a total military operation. They did, uh, they did everything militarily there. And we hadn't massacred that yet, so we were going to get that on March 19th. So now we'll go into a carrier operation. In order to get a carrier operation launched, we have to take those airplanes out of there at a rate of about 6 to 10 per minute. And I'm talking from the time, in the case of the SP-2C, that was this airplane, with the load and a relatively new airplane as far as the field operation goes, uh, we had a, a gross weight that would not permit us to, and we didn't, we had so many airplanes on the, on the deck that we had no, no running time to just make a normal takeoff. So we were going to be catapulted. Now, oftentimes I've asked a chair to be sit there and I've, I've sat in the chair the way we sit in a catapult, in a cockpit seat when we're ready to get catapulted. Uh, anyway, on that mission, 
well, let's first mention this. This is kind of a foundational thing, too. The Navy called the unit, the biggest unit, single unit they had in the, in the Air Force, the Navy Air Part, they called that a task force. The task force was comprised of five task groups. A task group was about anywhere from 12 to 20 ships, depending, depending on the time and the availability and so forth. So uh, we had actually, when, when the flag was appointed on that, and the flags were given 90 days and then they were relieved, uh, they, it was called Task Force 58, and when the relief came in, it was called Task Force 38. Now, if you picked up the New York Times, uh, you thought we were pretty strong because they sent 400 airplanes over Tokyo. Well, that was true, but uh, in fact, they expanded that a little. They said 1,200 airplanes over Tokyo. That was true if you added up all the times we flew over Tokyo. But if you were looking at the one raid, uh, no, we were down to 400, and some of our raids, we couldn't launch all 400 airplanes at the same time and be over the target at the same time. So in the case of March 19th, our, our job was, we were fully armed, ready to go, and um, just a little bit of explanation of what that means to the plane captain and the pilot of each individual airplane. You're, uh, you've probably heard in some movie of some kind, gentlemen, start your engines. Well, we had, we don't, at that time we didn't have ladies in the airplane, but n now we do. But uh, th when the commander of the operation said, gentlemen, start your engines, everybody, it took about uh, 10 seconds to start this engine because we had to have a big inertial wheel and to drive that two bank engine to rotate it to the point where the firing operation would start. So it was a, about a 10 to 15 second operation. If your airplane wouldn't start, and at that point our wings were folded, from this point on each wing folded overhead in the SB-2C. In the fighters they folded back uh, along with the torpedoes. And when, uh, when we get our engine started, the plane captain is going around there, a very fast guy, and, and there's four airplanes across the deck, uh, the beam of the ship. And those, the skipper in our case, because the dive bombers are first. I'm retrogressing here a little bit because you, you, you probably wonder why the dive bombers were first. There was a very good reason. Dive bombers had to dive 90 degrees. That means straight down. And don't weenie on that, because if you do, your bomb's going to go all over the Pacific, they, straight down. And most of us had 100 dives in by the time we got to this position. But the launch, getting back to the launch, after the plane captain circled the airplane and you got your engine started, then you're quickly taxied. In the meantime, your, finger, your wings are unfolding you quickly taxied into the catapult there and they put a cable. There was a hook under your airplane facing aft like that. The airplane in this case is facing forward. And there's a, there's a strap, a, a metal, a, a metal uh, cable across there that's attached to two points on the deck. And our position as pilots in that airplane, we sit back with our head clamped against that headrest. And if you turn your head 45 degrees, it'll break your neck. You had to be very careful. I don't recall of one person ever, that lesson came across very clearly, but you had to plant your head in the headrest. You had to plant your feet on the rudder pedals, and you had to take your arm and do like this because we ran our engines up to full RPM and full power which was uh, 2,700 RPM, and uh, on the, at sea level was about 2,000 horsepower. Uh, we had to take our arm and put that forward like that so that the stick, the, the control, if you're not that acquainted with airplanes, the main control, as far as the flight controls are concerned, is a stick. Nowadays it's far different, but in those days it was a stick, 
And if that stick came back like that because of the shot it was going to get, that would pull the nose of the airplane up and you'd go into a vicious stall and 30 feet later you'd be in the drink. So you had to make sure that your arm was across to prevent that stick from coming back. And, all, and this fist was there behind the throttle so that the throttle would come back and your engine would be uh, idle and your RPM and your mixture control was all in that session. And, and the guy that was the launch officer, he, he'd do like that. That meant the number one run up and you'd run it up and see that you had the gauges at 2700 and you were getting full power, full manifold pressure. And then he'd do a two run up and bing. Now that gave us about, to get six to 10 in the air in a minute meant the guy that was taxing behind you was there with everything ready to go. And as soon as you got your launch, he was up there and clipped on and bing, bing, bing. Now the object of uh, a takeoff is to, to get a, a formation together, you've got a rendezvous. So in our case, since we were 58.1, and since that day they apparently had sequenced us so that 58.1 would leave at, say, 9.30 and 58.2 at 10. In other words, spread them out. We didn't want 400 airplanes over the target at the same time. And remember, we were headed for Curry. So we started a slightly right turn, but before, while I'm sitting there, just before they're ready to put me on the catapult, I look up and here's a Jap fighter come right across about 400 feet off the deck. His 450s, I was looking right down those barrels and that guy would have pulled the trigger, he'd have done away with the carrier because we were nothing but a floating bomb. We had all kinds of ammo and all kinds of gasoline and everything that you wouldn't want in a case like that. But whether this guy got lost or not, or looked down and said, hey, there's no meatballs in these airplanes. I must have the wrong fleet here. But he was stunned. He flew down the length of the carrier. And I didn't see him there because I'm paying, paying attention to what I'm supposed to be doing here. But I was told he was shot down by the battleship behind us. Uh, so that was the first shock a Right after that, I got my shot and I'm out here, and the shot is so hard, when you slow down to your own acceleration, you actually slide forward on your shoulder harnesses. We, we had shoulder harnesses then, but the difference between acceleration was so great, it was like you were stopping, only you weren't. You were just accelerating far less than the catapult did. Uh, well, once we got airborne, and stowed our gear, and, and then we're looking for, in my case, I was looking for Fran Ferry. He was the guy I had a rendezvous on. And I'm looking for him, and on the horizon, the USS Franklin is on fire. And I mean, it's black smoke. And, uh, but, uh, but I don't dare to concentrate on that, because if I don't stay in my rendezvous position, I'll never make it. I'll, I'll, I'll end up chasing this guy all in the sky, but I'll just never make it. Uh, and the Navy won't be very happy with